Life is filled with uh, many important decisions and there's no more important decision than a decision that uh, concerns our future, uh, our future with God uh, beyond the grave and uh, today that's what we're going to be looking at. I, I, I don't know if you're a person who likes to walk through cemeteries. Um, when I was a young person I used to walk through cemeteries and have fun doing so but for very different reasons. Uh, it was basically to do it at night time and spook my mates. Um, uh, but now I tend to walk through cemeteries uh, and just be interested in what people have written on their tombstones. Uh, there's one particular tombstone that I've never seen, but interestingly a man at West, Ham, uh, West Narrabri this morning was telling me that on his great-great-grandfather's tombstone are written these words. I've never seen these words on a tombstone, but I read about them and they go like this. Pause, stranger, when you pass me by. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you shall be. So prepare for death and follow me. That's a happy little tune, isn't it? <laughs> I'll put that one to music, hey? I've got a great one for encouraging people to, event, to, to vandalise tombstones, but I have to say... Um, on this occasion, somebody vandalised this tombstone and I think they got it right. Um, please don't go doing that anywhere, will you please? But on this occasion, this vandal got it right. So this passerby inscribed underneath these words other words and here's what he said. To follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> Now, can I say that's a very clever inscription, isn't it? But it's actually quite pointed because the inscriber knows that there are two destinations for, for the end of life. That there is a destination that is heaven and there is a destination that is hell. And today we're going to look at that on the lips of Jesus. Now, I hope you won't shoot the messenger which is me today, I'm just delivering to you the message that Jesus Christ delivered so many thousands of years ago when he was amongst us. Uh, there are many questions that people ask about death. Indeed, it was the top of the list of questions asked by the girls at Neg School. They were given an opportunity to raise any issues that they wanted to raise with their chaplain and uh, then uh, that those issues would then be spoken on. And the number one issue that they wanted addressed was the issue of death. I guess that's because at schools they tend not to talk about death all that much. Families don't tend to talk about death all that much. We beautify it these days in cemeteries by just growing gardens and putting the plaques in the ground so that nobody can actually be confronted by death because we simply don't want to have to deal with death. But there are a world of questions to be asked. Now, I want to say this at the very beginning. Um, often when you give a talk like this, people will come up to you at the end of a service and they will say to you, can you tell me where you think my brother's gone? Or can you tell me where Aunt Mary is? Because I'm not sure that Uncle Fred knew exactly what was going on. Can you tell me where he is? Can I say I haven't got a clue where people ultimately are? Only God knows that. But what I can tell you is that the God I know and the love of the Lord Jesus is profoundly great. It's enormously good. And God will make no mistakes when it comes to your loved ones in terms of their eternity. So um, please don't come and ask me that question at the end of the service. Everyone okay? All right? Because I'll just simply say, you need to say your prayers, look to Jesus and trust in him. And having said that, that really is the key to today's talk, really. It's not about where those who have already passed have gone to. The question today is, are you ready to meet the future? Because in the moments where we've got together now, what I want us to do is I want us to pull back the curtain on death for a moment and I want us to kind of stick our head through and have a look beyond the grave into the heart of death and ask ourselves the question, what will it be like 
one minute after we die. Got it? I could say one second after we die. Um, it might take a little moment, more than a second, to kind of assess where you find yourself. But a minute after is as good as anything. So we're going to pull back the curtains and take a look inside. And we're going to do it from this story that Jesus tells. Would you please notice with me that Luke 16 and ver from verse 19, the story of the rich man and Lazarus, will you please notice that it is not referred to as a parable? In the old days, some of the translations used to say, here is the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. It actually doesn't follow the pattern of Luke's gospel. In Luke's gospel, Jesus consistently, when he told a parable, it says, and Jesus told this parable, and Jesus told this parable, and Jesus told this parable. Can I say to be consistent with the text of Luke, it doesn't say that here. So I don't know that it is a parable. In fact, I don't think it is. I think Jesus knew something about life and death and he was presenting it to us in a way that people would understand. Okay? That's the first thing I want to say. It's the best known story, really, in the New Testament about issues of life and death, hell and heaven, uh, and it's the story of uh, Lazarus and the rich man. Now, you've got to have your Bibles open because you're going to do a bit of work with me. I refuse to do all the work on a Sunday morning. I've done all the work in preparing the text for today, but you don't come to church on Sunday and do no work, so watch the text with me very carefully, okay, and see what Jesus says. You notice that both men died, didn't you? Okay, both die. And did you notice that something happens to Lazarus? Lazarus dies... But there's no mention that he's buried. Did you notice that? I'm telling you that because I want you to know something else in a moment. Lazarus dies. There's no mention of a burial. But did you notice what else was there? What else was there? There's no burial, but there's angels. Did you notice that? And the angels take Lazarus and they carry him away and he rests in the arms of Abraham. Now, don't get all uptight about Abraham. If you don't know much about your Old Testament, Abraham was a very significant man in the history of Israel. He, um, he was the one to whom God made extraordinary promises into which the people of God could rest, okay, Great promises in which they could rest. And, of course, they were promises that found their fulfilment in Jesus. So when it talks about Lazarus resting in the bosom of Abraham, please understand that it's simply saying that Lazarus was at home and at rest in the promises of God. He'd reached the place of promise. Okay? Got that? That's what we see. He's not buried no mention of his burial. I imagine that when he died, they just came along like in a Monty Python movie, chucked him in the wheelbarrow, wheeled him out of town and threw him on the dung heap. Terrible ending to a life in this world, but a magnificent beginning and future one minute after he dies with the God he loved. Now, have a look at the rich man. Okay, you got the rich man in front of you? What does it say about the rich man? He died and was buried. Now, I'm assuming, I'm assuming that's there because Jesus is saying, that he is the guy who's the rich man in town. He's got everything. He's got prestige. He's got the lot. And on the day he died, they had a big burial service for him. The crowds came, everyone was ushered in, they sat, he, they probably um, played at the end of the service as he was leaving, the, the, the great you know, funeral service of the 21st century, but a different version of it back then, I did it my way, um, which of course is um, never the appropriate thing to have at a funeral service. That's the picture, buried. What's not there? There's no angels, is there? See the contrast? One man is poor, no burial, but the angels come and carry him away. One man is rich and there are no angels and his destination is dreadful. See that? It's all there in the text before you. Don't shoot me. I'm just telling you what Jesus said. Okay? But what's the difference here? 
Why, why is the rich man in hell and the poor man in heaven? Is it because rich people go to hell and poor people go to heaven? Is that the answer? I imagine we would hope that that's not the case because we live in Australia, don't we? And we are amongst the richest people in the world, aren't we? Yes, we are. Incre- well, not you. Um, you're just living off the fat of the parents, aren't you? <laughs> well, that's better than being rich, mate, let me tell you, when someone else is paying your bills, okay? Thank you for that little in... in, in, in what do you call it? Thank you for that little interruption. Um, hopefully you go home and tell your mum how thankful you are that they are paying your bills, all right? And that would be a good thing. And mum and dad are very happy with me at this point in time. Um, but why the difference? Well, if you go to verse 29, you might pick it up. Go to verse 29 in the passage and you'll notice that in verse 29, Abraham says to the rich man who's asked questions, he says, the rich man's concerned about family that are still alive. He doesn't want them to come to where he is, which is a place of torment. And, he said, and Abraham says to him, they have Moses and the prophets, they should listen to them. Now, if you know about Moses and the prophets, you would know that Moses and the prophets is simply a shorthand way of speaking about the word of God. God spoke in the past through Moses and the prophets and all Abraham is saying to the rich man is, they have the word of God. If they listen to the word of God, then they will be okay. Implication? For the rich man who's in hell? What is it? He didn't listen. He had the word of God, but he never listened to it. Now, this is an ancient story, isn't it? 2,000 years ago, on the lips of Jesus. The implications are clear back then. What would be the implications today? Hmm. Exactly the same, Warwick. Implications are... You have the word of God, listen to it, and you won't end up in the place of torment. Correct? So we need to be very careful that we listen very carefully to what God says. Of course, we will get more information in a little while's time, which is going to be even more encouraging for us. But let's let's pull back the curtain and have a look inside verse 24. You see in verse 24... That one minute after the rich man dies, he is fully conscious. In fact, both of them are, but you see this particularly with the rich man. Notice that he's fully conscious when he's dead. He feels thirst, but it's not quenched. He converses with Abraham and is completely disappointed with the outcomes of the conversation. He remembers his family, which he can only feel worry for, but he can do nothing about. And did you notice that he recognises poor Lazarus but starts giving orders that Abraham should send Lazarus to quench his thirst? Did you notice that? Nothing's changed for the rich man. There he is in hell and he's still full of himself thinking that other people should serve him. There is an absolute arrogance and pride that comes with a person that will not listen to the word of God. I mean, if, if the rich man had listened to the word of God, you know what he would have done? He would have taken care of the poor. And you know what he would have done? He would have taken water and he would have quenched the thirst of poor Lazarus. Yet now, in hell, he still thinks he can cry across the chasm and ask that Lazarus be his servant and quench his thirst. It's a terrible picture, really, of complete and utter unrepentance even beyond death. <coughs> one minute after he dies, this, notice this verse 26. One minute after he dies, the rich man realises that his destiny is eternally fixed. Did you see that, verse 26? There is a chasm, we're told, that can't be crossed from either side. For Lazarus, nothing can ruin his rest. And for the rich man, nothing can improve his pain. Isn't that a dreadful picture? But it's also a beautiful picture. 
Can I say to you, if you're in Christ today, if you love the Lord Jesus and you are one of his children, there is coming a day when there is no cause of evil, no sin, no doer of evil who will, able, who will ever be able to unsettle your rest. Nothing will be able to unsettle that. That's good news, isn't it? That's really good news. Nothing can cross from the place of judgment on sin and evil. Nothing can cross from there to actually do God's people any further damage. That's great news, isn't it? But then having said that, nothing can cross from heaven to hell to resolve an eternal future for people who have not listened to what God's got to say. It's pretty serious talk, isn't it? Don't you think? Really serious. Now, uh, this next little comment I've got to say is, it's me reading into the text. You've got to be very careful when a preacher reads into the text and not what the text actually says. But I think this is not a bad assumption from the text, okay? But I'm giving you a warning that that's what it is. It's an assumption. Did you notice that one minute after the rich man dies... He seems to know that God's justice is right. He doesn't complain about it. He, 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 there's no voice here saying, this is really unfair. I don't deserve to be here. He doesn't stomp his foot like a child at home who's not getting what he wants. There's none of that. He seems to understand that he actually is getting what he deserves. And I think to myself, that's just a window into reality that we don't often see in the world. Because in life, I constantly meet people who want to damn God for his, judge, for, for his justice. In life, people are always saying, oh, it'd be very unjust for God to send anyone to hell. That wouldn't be very loving, would it? It would. And if you don't understand the connection between God's love and God's justice, can I say you will never understand the cross of Christ. You see, the cross of Christ is where the love and the justice of God come together in the person of Jesus. It's, if, if I can talk about it in terms of its application to us, which is wonderful, God's justice should fall on sinful people, should fall on us. But instead of falling on us, it falls on God's son. He takes the justice of God. He bears the justice of God in punishment for sin upon the cross. And what does he do in love? He allows us to avoid the justice of God and receive the forgiveness of sins. Love and justice together. They don't get separated they are held together. If you want love without justice, then just watch Hollywood, okay, which is about as real as Mickey and Donald, okay? But if you want re to understand the connection between love and justice, look no further than the truth of the cross of Christ and you will get a good grasp of it. But here is a man who in this world I reckon probably would have been questioning God's justice, but the moment he dies and finds himself in hell, he actually realises, this is what I deserve. This is what I deserve. <coughs> How are you going with the justice of God? How are you going with your sin? Have you brought it to Christ? Have you laid your life before Christ? Have you come to him and asked him for forgiveness that you might escape the justice of God? I hope you've done that. Let me get back to what I know the text says. Did you notice that one minute after the rich man dies, he does something really, really odd? He does something really, really odd that would even sometimes be odd in church. Did you see what he wanted to do? Go back to the passage with me again. Notice verse 27. He says, Father, he said, 
then I beg you to send him to my father's house because I have five brothers to warn them so that they won't also come to this place of torment. What's he doing there? Well, the rich man in hell is begging Abraham to have someone go back and do mission in Narrabri. Hear that? I find this extraordinary. I imagine that the rich man would have been like most people in church on Sundays when Tim comes at the beginning of the year and he lays out the plan and the map for what we're doing over the next 12 months and he has that moment in it where he wants to say to you, well, look, in May of 2009, we're going to do a special week in Narrabri. You know that what kind of week we're talking about? What kind of week is it? It's going to be a mission. mission. Did he say it's going to be a mission week? A mission week, really? Let me check my diary. Oh, yeah, we could have our holidays then. (laughs) We could be away. Oh, phew. That's the way we relate to mission, don't we? For the rich man on the other side of the grave, he can think of nothing else but mission. The whole of his life he completely ignored the idea of the mission of God. In fact, that's obvious. He stepped over Lazarus almost every day, paid no attention. But now in hell he's saying, oh, we need a mission. We need a mission to go back and rescue our family. And I reckon in Narrabri Cemetery there are buried people who in hell are crying out that a mission might be conducted to the living. And you know what? They can't do it. Only the living can. If you've been invited to church this morning by somebody in Narrabri, it's the first time that you've come. Can I just suggest to you that that's the kindest thing that anyone has ever done for you? Because they've heard the cry of mission. And they've said, there's no one, nothing more important for me to do than for you to come and be introduced to the Saviour of the world. And it is my hope that you will come to church if you've come for the first time today. It's my hope that you've come and that you will leave differently. That your mind will have been changed about the person of Jesus. That your heart will have been strangely warmed towards needing him. And if you're a regular here, I hope that you would realise that there are people desperate for your mission as Christians and that you will tell them of Jesus, the one who loves them. Do you notice that in the end the rich man does this strange thing? He says, um, Moses says to him in verse 29, look, they have Moses and the prophets, they should listen to them. Did you see what he then says? He says, that's not a big, that's not good enough. I want something bigger, something like that sends off the fireworks and everyone will be attracted and nobody will be in any doubt. Uh, This is do something so convincing that people will definitely come to a right mind about God. See what he says there, verse uh, 29, verse 30, sorry. He says, no, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they'll repent. That's right, isn't it? I mean, if somebody was to die and then to suddenly rise from the grave and appear to everybody having defeated death, that'd be a winner, wouldn't it? You go, I'll believe that. I'll put my trust in that. Of course. And when Jesus, who tells this story in chapter 16, then dies in chapter 23, crucified on a cross for the sins of humanity, and then three days later rises from the dead, you remember what happens, don't you? The whole of Israel repented and believed, didn't they? Everyone rushed to Jesus and said, Oh, you're back. I was so sorry for what we did. That's not what happened, is it? No, in fact, they they tried to shut the whole message down. Because it really does take a miracle to change a hardened heart. 
And it will take a miracle today to change your hardened heart if it's still hardened. But God is in the habit of doing miracles, even raising the dead. So I want to say to you tonight, today, the dead has come back to life. He's revealed himself and made known to us that death is but a door to a future life in which we can rest in the promises of God. Do you believe that? Because you can. See, it's a pretty ugly story in so many ways as you look at the rich man, but did you notice Lazarus in the whole of the story? He doesn't have to say much, does he? He doesn't need to ask too many questions, does he? Because one minute after he dies, he's safe. And one minute after you die, it is possible, it is possible for us to be exactly where Lazarus is, resting in the sweet promises of God. Confirmed in the death and resurrection of God's son, Jesus Christ. It would be a real shame today for you to go home not knowing that one minute after you die, you are perfectly and utterly safe in the hands of your loving God. May God give you that assurance and may we all indeed put aside our pride and bring our sin to Jesus and simply ask him to forgive us and grant us a future with him. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, I, I don't really know too many people in this building very well. Um, but what I do know is that every single one of us have the capacity to live like the rich man in this very story that Jesus told. Busy with ourselves, full of our own pride in achievement, thinking we're safe by perhaps the things we do rather than by trusting in the one who does for us what we can't do for ourselves, and that's Jesus. And so, Father, I want to pray for everyone in this building today that we would realise that Jesus is the only life boy of salvation for a future beyond the grave. And that as Jesus speaks these words in the scriptures and as they're taught today, that we would all take hold of that life boy and hang on to Jesus as he takes hold and hangs on to us. Grant to us your salvation. Give us a heart for those who as yet do not know it. Help us to speak for Jesus. And yet, Lord, if there's someone in the building today for whom it's a little bit difficult to cross the line, to move from unbelief to belief, to move from trusting in self to trusting in Jesus, I just pray, Lord, that you would do a work in their life right this moment to challenge them to make that move, a move that they will never regret and a move that has eternal joy ahead of it. Help them, we pray. Help us all and help us to keep our eyes on Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen.